Hi, I'm Mark Randolph. I'm a serial entrepreneur, perhaps best known as the co-founder and first CEO of Netflix. And you're watching Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Hey everyone, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Brian. A pleasure to be with you. I usually ask my guest, how did you get this job? Well, I, I'm one of those people who usually doesn't have to rely on someone else to give me the job. I just go out and create it for myself. But if uh, by job you mean something that pays you, uh, I haven't been always that successful at that. But uh, it's okay. I'm in it for the uh, excitement. And if I uh, get paid, even better. I would love to hear more about that. But let's go back in the chronology a little bit to young Mark, what you were thinking about when you were a kid. Um, I like to ask this question with a little bit of context, what you wanted to be when you grew up. Because there's a lot of people right now, whether you're young, uh, coming out of school, uh, trying to figure out what you want to do, or maybe you just got crushed by the pandemic and you're having to reset your entire career in life. Um, I like to talk about signals and how you arrived at where you did, the path you took. What were you thinking about when you were a kid? Well, I was certainly not thinking about anything close to where I ended up. I mean, I... I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, probably till I was close to being almost 30 years old. I mean, it, it was such a different time. I mean, there's so much pressure on kids these days to know what they want to do. Um, but it's such an unreasonable expectation. And especially for someone like myself, who at the time, I just kind of knew that I liked making things or building things or trying things. And of course, you know, now there's this thing called being an entrepreneur. I mean, and there certainly were entrepreneurs back then, but no one used that term or certainly didn't glorify it. But I was just someone who would see a hole and wanted to fill it. You know, I, I had this early job when I was really young, maybe six or seven, and I was selling seeds, you know, like you'd make, you used to grow a plant. Uh, for like the American Seed Company or something like that. And it was pretty uh, uh, brutal. I mean, basically you'd sell 10,000 packets, you'd earn a whistle or something like that. But it was a great experience because it was door to door salesman. Um, and you go to the door and they slam the door in your face and you go to 10 of them and pretty soon you'll learn what it takes to get them to hold the door open so you can say something. And then you'll learn what can I do to actually get the order or increase the order. Um, and you're constantly trying things. You're trying to invent a different way. You're going, how am I going to crack this problem? Um, and for some reason, that puzzle has always fascinated me. You know, even in, in high school, you know, I was the person who was always getting friends together to put on a play or let's start a magazine. You know, in college, I was starting clubs. I would just see something that I thought would be fun to do and saying, let me see if I can figure out a way to do it. And it just turned out in one of life's wonderful fortuitous circumstances that eventually that became a way to actually uh, make a good living. Awesome. I have lots of questions. Um, put, a, <laughs> put a time stamp on this period of time that you're talking about that wasn't popular to be an entrepreneur because I remember it as well. Um, but what, what era are we talking about for you? So uh, for those of you who can see me, you can tell that I've been actually around for a while. Um, this was the 60s, and you know, I was born in 1958. So I was uh, you know, a preteen in the 60s. I was a teenager in the 70s. Uh, I didn't become a quote-unquote professional until uh, the 80s. Um, and so this was, this was quite a while ago. I mean, this predates the, uh, the personal computer. It predates a lot of the technological things we take for granted now. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, just for context, I mean, you were sort of, you know, growing up in the same area as like the, the Waz and the Michael Dells, you know, those guys who are thinking, you know, that technology was going to be the next frontier um, and were, you know, starting to really come up with some cool things in their garage. This was you know, the mid to late 70s heading into the 80s, right? Sure. Well, I would challenge that they either of them really believe that the technology was the next frontier. I mean, I think especially, you know, Steve Wozniak basically was going, this is the coolest thing that I can build my own computer just by getting parts I hustle up out of the spare part bins. Um, 
And I think most people who ended up being successful coming at that period were motivated by the same thing. There was certainly no track record that showed you could start a technology company and have it be remotely successful. But we were all driven by this, wow, there's some really interesting things that you can do. I mean, Michael Dell is another great example. Um, he was in some ways a hero of mine because my first 15 years uh, a career, I was a direct marketing guy. You know, I was doing catalogs, I was doing direct sales, I was doing mail order, direct response programs. And what you may see Michael Dell is doing is really inventing a computer company. I said, oh my gosh, here's a guy who took a product which historically was sold to corporations or sold in stores and figured out a way to go direct to consumers. That is the coolest thing ever. And so, but that's the type of thing that would have, uh, that totally intrigued me is how do you, how do you figure out a new way to sell something, uh, to do something, to deliver a good or a service? Point taken. Very good. And I can, that's somewhat relatable, the door-to-door -door sales experience. I did that as well. I actually sold the LA Times door-to-door -door for a while, working my way yeah. through college while I was busting tables or, you know, whatever else I was doing. It's super helpful to understand uh lots of different things getting over rejection you know dealing with people trying to resolve problems uh yeah getting thick skin and this fundamental one that there's no single right way to do something that if some, someone starts you off they go okay here is how you go to the door to sell a subscription but pretty soon you realize that is a pretty flawed methodology. I've got to improvise. I've got to figure out what my individual skill sets are. I've got to figure out what works better to go on a rainy day or to go on a sunny. I mean, and and so much of starting a company is like that. There is no um, j manual that says here is what you do in every individual step. Uh, you have to uh, be situationally aware and figure it out as you go. And I think, you know, salesmanship is a tremendously great training ground for that. I, I encourage everyone to have a job where you have to do something and do it over and over and over again and learn that method of improvement. Uh, you're causing me to reflect a bit and uh, it's really good because there, there are just a ton of good lessons. The other one that comes to mind is that, you know, it's sort of this idea that, that Simon Sinek has talked about in his books, you know, that people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And um, that marketing or sales is really not about features and benefits, it's about telling a story. And I remember having the most success when I would tell my story. And oftentimes people couldn't care less about the newspaper, but they're like, I really like you, I wanna support you, I wanna do this. And so it ended up being about me and my story more than the features and benefits. And, and that was a, a huge lesson. We, it's really such a fascinating thing. And unfortunately, I kicked myself. I didn't really learn that it was a methodology until much later in my life when I really totally bought into storytelling and its powerful force. But I, I remember one of the companies that I, I started was a mail order company. It was called um, Mac Warehouse, sold Macintosh uh, com peripherals, software, those sort of things. And uh, I was coming out of the direct response business and I was this deep customer service oriented person. And I set this crazy goal that I wanted to have every single order that came in, I wanted it to ship that day. And to the point where at the end of the day, I made it someone's job, I say, you're gonna go through and find every single person who ordered today, but for some crazy reason, maybe beyond our control, it didn't ship and I want you to call them and apologized, we weren't able to ship your order. And we went back and looked at lifetime value for the people who we had missed the first order on, and it was off the charts. And at first we were going, why would us messing up on their first order drive lifetime value off the charts? And it wasn't that at all. It was because we had made this human connection with them, that we had become vulnerable, that we had apologized personally, and it was unlike uh, anything they'd ever received from any company they'd done business with before. And it just immediately made this emotional connection between us and the customer. It's gonna go sidebar here for any young person who's watching. So same day shipping and all that, you know, we have that with Amazon, one click buying, you know, arrive the same day, Uber Eats, you know, immediate gratification. None of that existed. That was like uh, 
a, a moonshot <laughs> back in the 80s, even, you know, 90s before the internet, right? Like that was, that's pretty revolutionary. Um, I'm actually more proud in some ways of that innovation than I am of so many others that I was part of um, later on. But making next day delivery, it was magic for people. I mean, and, and it was not, it was not easy. I mean, it required changing a lot of the ways we did business, but you know, it was recognizing that things were changing and what made it possible is seeing the development of things like Federal Express, which was brand new back then and saying, wow, Federal Express, of course, is promising we'll be, deliver business documents, but I wonder if we could use that. No, that couldn't be economical. And lo and behold, it ends up being this huge secret weapon for a business. So you didn't know what you wanted to do until age 30 or it didn't really crystallize for you. But like, so did you get influence from your parents? Were they involved? Did they say, Mark, we want you to become, you know, a plumber or a doctor or run a flower shop or like, were you steered in a certain direction? It, it, to a degree, yes, but not in the way that you may think of, we want you to do this or do not that. There was two things. Um, the first was that my parents were always encouraging my risk taking. So they were the type of parents, like I remember one time I came home and I was, I was kind of getting into climbing at the time. And I said, uh, dad, I'm gonna try and teach myself to repel the process, you know, where you slide down a rope. And I'm gonna do it from that, uh, that big oak tree in the backyard. And whereas I'd imagine most parents would go, you're out of your mind, you're gonna break your arm. He went, oh, there's probably a rope back in the garage. You know, get out and figure it out. Um, and that happened time and time and time again. But the other one was that my father um, spent his whole life working for someone else, but even worse, he was a money manager and he was man managing money for people who in large part were entrepreneurs who had made a lot of money running their own businesses. And he used to tell me in that almost sad way that you look back at your, seeing your parent feeling they may not have been as successful as they wanted. And he would say, you know, gosh, Mark, the, what's so evident to me is the only will Ray to make it these days is to have your own business to do your own thing. And I'm not saying that pushed me to doing it, but it gave me this slight emotional push to do something which is inherently very, very scary and very, very high risk. And most entrepreneurs that I've seen successful have some kind of emotional challenge. Um, and I kind of think that might've been one of mine too, was this feeling that I had seen my father yearning, wishing he could have been that, and that this might be something that um, I might enjoy doing. Yeah, I think that's so interesting. I think a lot about nature versus nurture for a lot of personal reasons. Um, but I also think maybe it's worth saying again, you know, if, if it's sort of subtle advice, but I want to underscore, and that is, I think we really have to be careful to consider the source, you know. Um, our parents, you know, uh, maybe our closest relationship, maybe not. Um, but whoever is giving that ad advice, we sort of have to run it through several filters, right? Like that may have just been his life experience as a product of growing up uh, in the 40s and 50s, right? Someone coming out of uh, World War II era, you know, and, and into the 70s and 80s when everything was happening. So maybe he was seeing it as like he sort of lived uh, risk averse and saw this opportunity and wanted to kind of give you that opportunity. That may be the right advice or that might have been the right advice, but we just have to be careful because uh, <laughs> sometimes, you know, um, someone projects their worldview or their, their experience on you and it may or may not be the right path, you know? It's, it's a terrifying thing in a way because, you know, I used to, growing up, you see the, someone your age and they go, yeah, I want, want to be a doctor and it's because their parent is a doctor. Or they go, I wanna be a lawyer. Well, their parent's a lawyer. And you go, that's kind of creepy. Um, and it's creepy until all of a sudden you have kids and they're going, I think I wanna be an entrepreneur. And, uh, and you go, what is this? What, are they just wanting to blindly follow? But I actually, 
I have, I, because it's happened to me, because I have had an older son who said, I kind of would love to do what you do. And it forces me to go, why? And what do I think about this? But what I really think it is, is that the one thing you can do for your kids is model what happiness is. And I think my kids growing up saw how engaged and excited and fulfilled I was as an entrepreneur. Um, and they never saw me coming home and saying, I hate work or I'm dreading to go back to, they saw the opposite. They saw me eager to go back to work on Monday mornings. And so I think it's kind of natural for them to see that type of career as something that actually holds something that might deliver the same uh, value to them. Um, and, but I did force my son when he said, I want to do this. Um, I said, you, you want to start his own company. And I go, you are not going to move to Silicon Valley and just go in. I said, I want you to spend some time really understanding what you might be in for and helped him find a CEO in a very small company, you know, five people where he'd be, have a front row seat and see what a startup CEO did all day. How in many ways uh, of a grind it is, um, how difficult it is. Um, how disappointing it can be sometimes. And I said, if you can sit at this person's right arm for an entire summer, at the end of the summer, you think that's something you're cut out for, then I'm, uh, I'm all in and supporting you. And that's also really good advice. And, and I, what you're saying is that it's a really good idea to try stuff on for size to see if it fits. Because you have this image of, I want to be that. You know, it looks glamorous. You think, oh, I could do that or whatever you're intentions are but it's not until you actually try it on for size until you know that it fits or not right oh absolutely i mean i think i can't remember who it was i was listening to a podcast and she was going you wouldn't like walk into a store and say i'll take all that you got to try things on and uh and see how they feel and see how they fit and i think it's exactly the same you know it Whatever you think is pretty meaningless. It's what you do and find out through experience that I think is the valuable thing. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that. <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going. But like I say, man, always said it. It's not about the destination. It's all about the journey. Ain't nothing changed but the weather. The dangling carrot that hang from the rear view. Uh -huh. Your dreams in the past ain't nowhere near you. Backseat drivers got nothing but two cents. Shotgun riders too biased, they all liars. I should get an A for effort, I'm too tired. But I'm never giving up, that's why I'm kinda admired. Role model, like it or not, I gotta play it. Sugarcoat the rhyme sometimes, but still say it. Said I was quitting at 40, it's just a fib. I'm still a kid that's wiping the food off of my bib. You ever wanted something so bad that you could taste it? Cried over everything. Every opportunity wasted yeah. good and bad news which one you want first either way you pick the bad still gonna hurt you the worst i never got the bask in the fruits of the labor uh -uh. and i never got the cash from that dude from the label i'm just thinking back